Hi, yeah, so as he said, I'm Brett Timperman. Uh, I work at Kroger. Um, it was a really exciting general session this morning. Uh, it has a lot of implications on what I'm going to be talking about here today. Um, so I'm the dev lead on the core engineering team. Um, they call me a dev lead. That doesn't really mean I get to do much development. It seems like mostly I go to meetings and talk about stuff, um, especially Docker. So uh, I, I get a lot of questions about, about Docker from my teammates during the day. So it feels like I'm kind of a, an internal support person. Um, so Kroger, if you don't know of us, we're a grocery retailer. We're actually the third largest retailer in the world, even though we only operate here in the United States. And if you haven't heard of us, it's because, probably because we go by many names. Um, here in Seattle, you might know us at Fred, as Fred Meyer. Um, if you come up here from San Francisco, you might know us as Ralph's or any of these other banners um, that are throughout the country. So today we'll be talking about uh, framing our story with uh, Kroger's digital transformation. Uh, we started on a, a few years ago as a few teams working on a mostly marketing site, kind of a brochure site as we like to call it. Uh, a few years ago, we started doing e-commerce. We're doing a, an application that we call a ClickList, um, which is a, a buy online and pick up at the store application. Now, uh, we were just recently named uh, number 45 in the top 100 places to work in IT and computer world, which is pretty exciting. So today we're going to learn some of the tools and capabilities that have been critical to our growth. And I'm going to start with a story. Every Friday, Kroger offers a coupon for a free item. And this is on our website. So this particular Friday, as thousands of customers were lining up trying to get in, our site was hard down. So imagine that you have a store and you close it as soon as all your Black Friday customers come up. Or you hold the door against some angry zombies. And you've got no monitoring, so your system kind of looks like the fog here in this GIF. So what do you do? Restart the servers, of course. This time, though, we weren't so fortunate. It didn't really work for us. The apps would start and come up for a few minutes, and then they would quickly run out of memory and die again. We're perplexed trying to figure this out because everything worked great in test. Sorry about the weird highlighting on these slides, by the way. I don't know where that's coming from. So our last release, we had only deployed a few changes. Uh, bug fixes, configuration tweaks, nothing really major. But at this point, we're losing some customers. So we try to scramble all the teams and dive in. We name our teams after Marvel characters. So this is kind of Avengers Assemble time. But it's a little bit less glamorous in real life. Uh, I don't know how it works in your company, but there's, if there's a major production outage, that means a conference bridge. And everyone from the company seems like they're on that one conference call. You have at least the on-call representative from every single team. And usually, they're asking the question, what changed out there? So we have escalating pressure, and we start to look at the log files. We hadn't quite figured out how to do logging yet with our distributed system, so we were downloading two gigabyte log files from all of our machines, trying to parse through all the noise in there. It's a lot like trying to figure out a, a redhead in the matrix or something like that. All we really know is that things are bad. So we start looking through the git commits, and we actually find something. So at Kroger, we use a, a library from Netflix called Hysterix. Uh, this is a really nice um, circuit breaker library for Java. It manages your calls to downstream services in a thread pool. And if those services time out or fail, the service opens, and that prevents further from connections from going down there. And this pseudocode shows a quote unquote co correct implementation. Does anyone have an idea what our issue may have been this day? It was just a simple copy and paste error where you can see here that config timeout is set to be the value of threads. So our, our Hysterix thread count for each service was 5,000. And if you, you know, as customers are coming in, making a lot of requests, that's going to fill up the threads really fast, and the DVM just dies because it can't handle that overhead. So we asked ourselves, why wasn't this caught in tests? Um, uh, one reason is that our tests 
our test environment used the default values, as you see here. And we had the habit of, in production, to always specify what those values are. Um, you, could, you could maybe make the argument that we should have tested this scenario in pre-production, and I would agree with that. But I think the real issue here is that we didn't test this in production with the production configuration. And I believe that code is never fully tested in production, uh, or never fully tested until it is tested in production. And Solomon kind of echoed this statement this morning. I liked what he was saying about how all the best tools are iterative and they're deployed to real customers. You get real feedback. And that cycle is so important. There are always differences in an environment. Um, so you, know, you can test your Docker container. And that's really nice that you can, you can portably move that container between your environments. But things like configuration, there's always going to be something that you really can't control. Um, I try to think of this as you know, testing in the real world. So um, on the airplane over here, there's no way I would have gotten on that airplane if it hadn't been tested with real physics in the real world. Um, this applies to, to many different things. Um, it's also a good point to note that customers don't care if your test environment works. If it's down, if your production environment is down, that's what's, gonna, what's going to bother them. But I definitely understand some hesitation to, to test in production. Uh, we kind of believe that it's a right and not a privilege. So we're going to talk about gaining the privilege to do that. So in production, you need some processes and safeguards, or you're going to disrupt your business critical systems and lose money. But they don't really have to be untouchable. If you have good monitoring and build pipelines, you should be able to safely deploy your code and know that you can roll it back if things are going wrong. And just because you have a touchable production environment doesn't mean that your developers are actually logging in and running commands on SSH. Um, in reality, they should probably be doing something like using the Docker remote API, setting a Docker host variable with a certificate, and running their commands that way. But at Kroger, we had not earned the right to test in production, and we needed to learn to deploy faster and safer. And this simple phrase is the core that underlines everything you're going to hear from me today. You could maybe rephrase this as open and secure, or self-service and auditable. And the, the idea behind this is that teams can quickly create what they need, and the tools don't get in the way. The ops and, and uh, security teams, they're able to have visibility into what changes are happening, who made what change when, and this really kind of makes, makes the whole process safe. So having defined this ideal, we, we challenged ourselves to mature so that we could reach it. If we weren't fast and safe, we could be sure that our competition would be. So we developed a list of capabilities. Today I'm going to call that capabilities the alphabet. I chose that because these are long-winded terms that we commonly refer to by abbreviations. So the title of my talk, Learning the Alphabet, these are the capabilities that we're going to learn about today. I'm not, definitely not the first person to talk to you about continuous delivery. It is, in my opinion, essential to modern application delivery, so we are going to mention it here. Uh, an important point is not to uh, confu confuse the idea of something being deployed as being deployable. So every build that you have in your system should not just be deployable, but releasable and functional, and you should have the quality processes around that. So continuous delivery and pipelines go hand in hand. Um, a build pipeline is just going to move your, your code commits through several different stages, probably build, test, deploy. Uh, we're setting up build pipelines for, for everything, um, especially when you think about everything being code, like infrastructure is code, and so on and so on. All good code should have, should have a build pipeline next to it. Blue-green deploys, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It's a pretty common practice in the industry. It's definitely a good starting point if you don't have it, which we didn't have three years ago. But the idea is you have two prod environments. You deploy your code to one of those environments that's not serving live customers, and then you update your load balancer to switch the traffic between those, between those instances. Um, containers make this really easy because you're able to just spin up as many versions of an application in a single environment as you want. So the real meat of this talk is about uh, split testing or A-B testing. 
And A-B testing, again, has the concept of two or more versions of your application. Both of those applications are live to your customers at any moment, however. And you usually distribute traffic based on maybe a percentage of your traffic or geolocation or IP. Uh, maybe you're looking at a group of beta users and you want to give this new feature to them. Um, and we're also going to be looking at Docker Data Center today as a platform to run, to run these, uh, all of our services on. So it's the containers as a service system um, provided by Docker. It gives you a secure environment to build, ship, run your containers. Uh, Docker Trusted Registry is one of the key components. Uh, it's pretty much like an internal Docker hub that runs behind your firewall. You can push and pull your images securely there. Docker Universal Control Plane is an administration interface. It allows you to run your containers, and it runs on top of Swarm, so it helps you with clustering and the like. Um, the, one of the key ideas with, with uh, using Docker Trusted Registry and Universal Control Plane is the idea of role-based access control. Um, and what that allows us to do is separate who can run or who can publish what versions of, a, of an image and that will help you to kind of safely manage who is, who is providing an image, who is able to run that image, and allows you to, to kind of separate things off by teams, which, which we find very valuable. And the idea of being able to do self-service, but still with the role-based access control, I think is very powerful. So you're, you're exposing the system to, to your customers, which might be development teams in your organization, and you allow those teams to run any containers that they may need. They don't have to worry about any kind of process for setting up that infrastructure. So having established where we're going, I'm gonna take a look back in time, talk about where we came from. So I love this image. I, I hope you can see it with the weird highlighting. But this is what I think of as dev and ops in the traditional enterprise, and you just kind of drop your code like a rock. Um, and it's a little bit more like dev versus ops rather than dev ops. And the teams are, are differently incentivized. So you have the, the dev team, which is incentivized for velocity, getting your commits out there very fast. You have the ops team, which is incentivized for uptime, keeping the service stable and running. This is an inherent tension if you're doing dev versus ops. So you might have the ops team defining, well, you can only deploy on every two weeks or every four weeks. And then what you get is your dev team packing in everything they can into that release. And that means you're gonna be deploying a lot of those boulders out to production that are very big, and very hard to roll back if things go wrong. Uh, the dev and ops teams don't collaborate and there's frankly a lot of contention, which is why I call it contentious delivery. So to get past this at a minimum, you need to break up the, the boulder that you're deploying. And we're looking at shrinking everything. Like a lot in the industry, we're going towards smaller code bases. These are a lot easier to maintain and deploy than your traditional monoliths. Um, we're looking at componentizing everything that we can. I like to go home and say, honey, I shrunk the code base. And speaking of code bases, we have the philosophy that everything is a code base. So we're adopting the open source model for infrastructure through things like reverse proxy configurations, base Docker images, your application code, and your configuration for that code. All of these things need build pipelines and tests. So with that open source model, you, kinda, you can use pull requests to define your workflow. And that gives you a, a process of approval and consensus for any given change. Now, it's pretty powerful that anyone on, in your team or on another team can propose a change, but it requires some approvers to, to pull that change into your code base so that you can, you can take that to production. That's also great for your security team. They'll love to see that audit trail of, hey, someone actually looked at this commit before it goes to prod. Then you know that you, know, you don't have stealth vandals on your team that are trying to disrupt your business by putting something in production. And uh, at Kroger, we use a lot of pair programming. And this can, it's kind of the idea of having someone else looking at your code as well. But you could do this with the pull request model, maybe have your, your pair uh, approve that request. 
Um, and using pull requests might introduce a little bit of overhead to your process, but I think it's valuable in the long term because it's going to reduce your technical debt and make things a lot cleaner and more deployable in any given time. Um, I'm going to do an example in a minute, but really quickly I wanted to talk about this pattern I call credentials containers. So these are small containers that have the TLS certs you need to build to uh, deploy to a certain environment. Um, and I use GitLab CI for build pipelines. And in GitLab, you can specify that your build runs inside a certain container. So your GitLab runner is configured to, to pull down that, that container that has your certs in it, and it runs the deploy script inside that. And that allows you to have your certs in a place that the devs don't really have access to them, and keeping that somewhat controlled so that they don't, they're not able to grab the certs out to their environment. Granted, they could probably add a build step that just you know, does a cat and outputs these to the, to the console, but with, with good auditing, you can, you can uh, manage that risk. So the workflow we're gonna talk about, um, a, very basement, a, a, very basement, uh, a very basic development workflow. Devs push code to Git, the CI is picking up that commit and pushing that to Docker Trusted Registry. Likewise, the DevOps teams is collecting, are collecting those certs, and they're pushing that to their own Git repository, which creates the credentials containers that I just talked about. Um, everything, all the, all the publish here is handed by CI, which I think is definitely a, a good practice. And it's also nice because the entry points into getting something into your system are just Git and your build pipelines. Ah, that might have fixed it. Thank you. I just thought everything in this presentation was so important it needed to be highlighted. <laughs> so we're looking at a, the Docker Trusted Registry configuration for the two images that I just talked about. You have your application images, which is the demo slash app repository, and your credentials container, which is the demo slash deploy repository. And this allows us to kind of nicely model our workflow in Trusted Registry. Uh, this is the permissions tab for, for the app container. You can see here that devs have read-only access to this container, and CI is the only thing that has access to read and write. So the image is only created by CI, but devs still have access to pull and run this container either locally or on an environment such as UCP. Likewise, for the deploy container, Everything is being published by the DevOps build pipeline, but CI also has access, the application team CI has access to pull this container and run it as part of a deployment script. And this allows, well, you can see that the devs don't have any access to see this, and it's a private image, so the devs will, will basically have no idea that it exists at all. And we manage the credentials on the actual CI runners, and that helps keep them, that helps keep them separate from the dev development team as well. So they can't, they can't go in and see like the Docker login credentials that are being used to actually pull this container down from, from DTR. So you know, we've, we've built a solid dev workflow, but we still have no insights into our application. We don't really know where are we, where are we going. So one of our, our, our biggest early wins was to create a, a proactive white box monitoring system. And we used a lot of open source components to pull this together. And once we had this, we could say goodbye to manually pulling down those log files and combing through them. Um, we now have a centralized system to which applications push their monitoring events directly. This allows us to visualize metrics, to aggregate our logs, and to trace requests by using correlation IDs. We decided to build this rather than buy one of the many solutions that are out there um, because this because of the, uh, the wide availability of open source tools in this space, as well as the desire to become domain experts about monitoring. You know, we learn best by learning, and if you are the one building it, you're gonna know it best. If you're looking to build this system, uh, there's a great book called uh, The Art of, Art of Monitoring by James Turnbull, just came out. Um, however, he kind of uses a different stack than us, but the ideas are, are definitely the same. So that monitoring tech stack 
And this, this monitoring app has a name, but I actually can't use it um, because of various legal reasons. So ignore the, the logo up in the top left corner, which you can barely see anyway. But there are several pieces. We have a few custom pieces. Uh, there's a custom piece called, uh, called Linux, which is listening for messages and does collection and filtering. And that passes messages to Kafka, which is the backbone of our messaging system. Uh, Kafka then, or data is then piped from Kafka into Elasticsearch, where we can run queries against that data. We have Kibana and other options running to actually visualize that data. Um, Mazer is here as well. That's an application that allows us to correlate all those events across systems. This system is deployed in Docker in production in, in our um, in Kroger today, and we're actually going to see it as part of our demo. So having this monitoring system, we must ask ourselves the question, what do we need to monitor? If we're just looking at troubleshooting, Google has a good concept of the four golden signals, also from, a, from another great book called Site Reliability Engineering. It just recently came out. I would definitely recommend it. But essentially, they, they talk about the, the four signals of latency, traffic, errors, and saturation. So you basically want to know how long your calls take, how much traffic you have coming in, any kind of errors and exception events, and your resource consumption. But that's just for troubleshooting, and often the business metrics are a lot more interesting and relevant to what we do. So it's important to, to, to look at what your team is providing to the business and see how you can measure that value. For us, being retail, it's pretty easy. That value translates mostly to sales and things like cart size, um, maybe a user account creation, but it's important that you know what the concept of a conversion means for your application and to be able to instrument that. It turns out when you implement monitoring, your bosses probably are going to love it more than you do, especially if you throw together some pretty dashboards. One of my managers um, is kind of a human alerting system. It seems like he's plugged into this dashboard constantly. Um, and if he sees things going down, he will email the team that is responsible. He's known to email teams probably about 15 minutes beforehand, warning them that, oh, you're going to have an outage in production. And often he's ignored, like, oh, everything looks fine here. I don't know what you're talking about. But then sure enough, 15 minutes later, their thing is down and they're getting paged. Um, you know, ideally, we would have a computer that does this job, but it's not really going to cure him of the monitoring addiction, I don't think. Uh, there's also the concept of service discovery and health checks. I was really excited by the keynote this morning and the built-in service discovery. That's so cool. Uh, really looking to playing with that. Right now, we're using console to, as a service to registry. And uh, most, most of you are also going to be familiar with the concepts of service discovery, so I'm not going to talk a lot about that. But it's very critical for us to enable the capabilities like A-B testing, like blue-green deploys, and dynamic scaling. You also, for added safety, having the concept of a health check is really great. Um, that's going to allow you to ensure that any traffic you're sending to a back end is going to be able to handle it. So A-B testing. Again, this is distributing traffic to different versions of your application that are all both like or these, these could be two to n versions of applications. We've actually been doing this at Kroger for a long time. If you remember one of my intro slides with all the different banners, those are different dot coms. So things that we roll out to customers, we want them to see and get feedback gradually, we deploy on one of our smaller banners. Or that was previously the practice that we would do that. Now we, now we would do a proper A-B test. But that allows us to get feedback from the customers very quickly and we know if we're doing the right thing or not. This graphic um, mentions that 50%, that the traffic is split 50 by 50. In practice, you're probably going to want to start your B route out a lot smaller, maybe something like 5 10%, um, so you know that you're not affecting the majority of your traffic should something go wrong. And anytime you're doing A-B testing, you always want real-time monitoring to go with that. That way you can know if, you're, if your experiment is actually successful or if you need to roll it back if things aren't looking good. And you can measure if it's successful or not by the concept of key, key performance indicators, which are probably the business metrics that we just talked about. Essentially, you know, if you're converting users, are you selling more items? Are you selling less items? If your sales go down, you probably want to roll that out immediately. Um, and 
the, 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 what they were showing off this morning with the Docker service update was pretty cool. And I, I think that could be used for A-B testing, at least for distributing a raw percentage. Um, so I'm definitely going to play with that soon and update some of my materials to show how the, the new stuff that's out in 112 is changing that. But when you think about an A-B test, a good A-B test is like a scientific experiment. And without science, we know that none of us would be today. Science is incredibly powerful because it works, and it works repeatedly. And if you can use the power of science to, to demonstrate that you are moving the needle forward, that's going to be very valuable information for you and your business. What we have here is a bit of a contrived example around, oh, well, we'll just change a button color, and maybe we'll get a bigger cart based off, oh, this button color is prettier, and I want to click it. Um, we're actually going to do this experiment live today, or at least a version of it. Um, but I like this experiment because it's limited in scope, and it has pretty controlled variables. This is the stack we're using for A-B testing. Again, with the 112 stuff, this could be a lot simpler, and so I'm really looking forward to exploring that. Um, but if you look at this diagram, uh, I have register plugged up to the Docker API, which is registering all the services that I deploy to Docker to console. Console is, or console template is then hooked up to console, so anytime that state changes in console, it will generate a new Nginx configuration drop it over a shared volume to the Nginx container and trigger a reload with the Docker API. Uh, we chose this stack over something built in like interlock because you can maybe move this out to a, another um, location. It doesn't necessarily have to be running alongside your Docker containers, which could be valuable based on however you're running your business. Um, it also allows separation between the things that have access to the Docker API and the things that are serving your production traffic. So like Registrator, for example, you have to mount in that, that Docker socket for Registrator to be able to make API calls. And we're actually doing the same with console template here because it's notifying Nginx to restart. But the traffic is only coming in through Nginx and then going straight to the Docker containers. So any traffic that you're serving to users is not exposed to that Docker API and you're kind of limiting that, that attack vector. There's a bit of a trade-off here because you have some more moving parts, makes things very complex. Um, again, I think the 112 stuff could drastically simplify this so that you don't really need to worry about those, those moving parts. There's also some alternatives you can maybe consider instead of using Registrator. A good alternative is to have your app just directly report itself to console. Uh, you could also use something like Joyance Container Pilot, build that into your into your containers, it will kind of wrap the process that you're running and handle all your interactions with console. So the, the magic of how the code that I, or the example that I built today works is through an Nginx split client directive. And console template is generating these directives based off uh, some key value information that we put into the, into the console key value store. So this directive specifies uh, both a hash, you see here as the remote address variable, and a variable. Um, and it allows you to specify what percentages will result in what variable value. So it's going to calculate a hash. I believe it uses the murmur hash algorithm to calculate this based off the remote address variable in this example. Um, wherever that hash lies on the distribution of the possible values of that hash is the value that's going to be passed to split. So for this example, the first 2%, the split is going to be equal to C. The next 10% of those hash codes, they're going to be assigned, that split variable is going to be assigned to B. And by default, we'll use A. And then you can plug these tags into your Nginx routes and use those to direct which upstreams um, that your traffic is going to go to. So this example uses a, that split tag that we saw in the previous slide. If that split tag has been set to B, for example, this will direct to a upstream called root B. And the code that I have will, um, will generate uh, upstreams based on the, the services that you have registered to console. 
and then also generate those split client tags so you're able to use these variables to direct your traffic into whichever upstream is appropriate for, for your, uh, your, your client routing. So I'm gonna switch over to a demo at this time. Here we have uh, GitLab. If you're not familiar with it, I think it's pretty awesome. I, I love to use GitLab CI. I really like their, their build pipeline concept. This is a very simple build pipeline. Essentially, it's running a Docker Compose file. Sorry, I'll uh, go back to the, uh, the GitLab CI so you can see the actual pipeline. This has one stage in it, deploy, and it's basically running Docker Compose down and Docker Compose up to take services down and, and put them back up. It sets the Compose project name to blue. We'll go look at the, uh, the Docker Compose file that it's actually running. And this is going to pick up that Compose project name variable. It's, it'll set the service tags and service names environment variables so that Registrator can do its job of taking that service, reporting it to console, and giving it a proper tag. We also have a variable here for button color, which an application that I wrote is going to take in that variable and use it to render the color of the button. And this is the actual application we're gonna be using. I had no idea that Docker was doing a dogs versus cats voting app, so this is very ironic, but I think the theme of this DockerCon is definitely dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. So out in universal control plane, I'll just go through this interface real quick. I have one instance of a service which is tagged blue, and it's running out there. So when I go to this load balancer and start refreshing, I always get that blue application. So now I'm going to switch back to GitLab real quick. I'm going to deploy a different color. So I have a a couple branches set up that have different colors. And I'm just going to uh, run a pipeline for the green branch. And as this runs, we see it pulls the credentials container that I have and just runs the Docker Compose up. So now switching back to Universal Control Plane. I can see that the green application is running there as well. So before we start doing any A-B testing, I would like to show you what the Nginx configuration looks like at this point. And again, I'm gonna use UCP just to get a, uh, a shell into the container. I'm running Alpine, so there's no bash. Have to use SH. So you would typically see the, uh, the split con client configurations up top. You can see there's a version of my slides actually running out there and some of the DTR containers. Let me try to find, yeah, here's, here's the root upstream that was created, the, uh, that dogs versus cats app. It, uh, the service name for it was set to root, if you recall, back in the, uh, the Docker Compose file. And it creates two upstreams, root blue and root green, which have those different colors. So now I am going to switch over to a UI to, to split some of my traffic to the, uh, one of the other servers. Sorry, got to look at the screen here. So, I'm actually using Docker for Mac to run this. You can see it's local host here on my Mac, which is cool. So refreshing this page, I now see that I have blue green, and, and green tags out there. So I wanna specify that 75% of my traffic goes to blue and 25 goes to green. And I'm going to save this configuration and swap back to my other screen. So now we'll look at this configuration again. Console template should have done its magic at this point. So now we see that there is a split client directive here. 
25% of traffic goes to green, the rest goes to blue. Swapping back to Pet Basket, I can start reloading it, and I see that green is going to show up about one in four times. So we have an A-B test. I would like to make sure that we can monitor that test. This is a, a look at our monitoring system. We're using Kibana for dashboarding. So these are the, the raw messages that we see. And I'll just kind of quickly show you what that format looks like. Things co come in, they specify which color they are. Um, this was just a page load metric. If I actually click the add to basket, I should see some sales metrics show up. So yes, now I have a couple of add to basket uh, messages. And in this message, it also specifies which pet was added to, added to the basket. So I'm going to go ahead and create a, a dashboard for us to watch that in real time. And for that, I'm just going to use a pie chart. I'll set up a split chart here so that we have as many charts as we have colors. And ask that to look at the message detail color field. And then add another split slices. And this will do slices in our pie chart based on, oh, I'm sorry, I need to pick a term here, or a field here. We're gonna base it on the pet and we'll order by count. So we now have a very basic, basic pie chart, uh, a lot of messages here. I'm gonna set this up to auto refresh so we see in real time, every 10 seconds. So now, I would like you out in the audience to go to this URL. This is the load balancer that I'm showing. Go out there and click a bunch of buttons. Hopefully the Wi-Fi is gonna work if you're on your laptop or if you can get a connection out with your phone. And I'd like to monitor the metrics in real time. Does everyone have this URL, or should I leave it up for a few minutes? I'll leave it up there just for a few seconds. It's dockercon.btim.pe, which is kind of like my name, Brett Timperman. So I'll switch back to my dashboard here. It looks like things are, are already changing. Whoops, my visualization is gone. There it is. So we're monitoring this in real time. This, you can probably hardly read it out there, but this is the pie chart for the green version. And this is the pie chart for the dog, or for the, uh, the blue version. And you can see that dogs are performing a little bit better than cats in blue. And even in green, dogs are still kind of performing better. But say that my test is that with a green button color, I thought we would sell more cats because dogs are just flying off the shelves. I've got a ton of cats. I need to move them. So swapping back to my UI real quick. It looks like green is doing okay, so I'm gonna dial down blue traffic to 60%, dial up green to 40, and save. Since this reloads Nginx, there should be no dropping of any requests out there, so none of you should see any downtime because I adjusted that distribution. So I'm gonna swap back to my other screen. Looks like things are, are roughly still the same. And what I wanna do is actually add another color. I think the green is performing pretty well, but uh, maybe a red button, that might really draw some attention. So I'm going to start a, another pipeline to deploy a red version of, a, of that service. 
And of course, I already have an existing branch for that. Now, if I reload this, I should see red. Cool. So I dial back blue a little bit and up red. So I'm now deploying red to 10% of the traffic. If you're really lucky out there and you refresh, you might get red. There may be a prize or there may not be. I'm not telling. So sorry for all the screen, screen swapping here. Going back to my monitoring dashboard, I should see some metrics for red start to pop up. Ah, oh, yeah, so some people have gotten red out there. And there is a nice big count of messages. Uh, people must be clicking buttons pretty furiously. <laughs> but yeah, I can see that cats are, hey, they're actually performing pretty well with this red color. So. I'm gonna swap back and take out green, ramp up red. So now re reloading pet basket, I should see a lot more red and a lot less green, or no green actually. So just add a bunch of dogs. Add a bunch of cats, because why not? I'm not actually buying them. And going back to my monitoring dashboard. I see that things are still looking pretty good for red. It has more cats than the other version. I'm actually just going to go ahead and let's make red the new thing. So dropping out blue, dropping in red, saving. And I can now see that it's red all of the time. So we've now performed an A-B test. We had the hypothesis that either green or red was going to work better for adding more cats. We saw it happen live in real time here with, with you out there. And we, we went to the new color. Yes. Yeah, just adjusting it in real time. So I, would pro I should probably go in and clear out my dashboard so the old data. So she was asking if every time I was uh, changing that distribution, if I was resetting the test, I, I believe, or, or just the parameters. Um, so if I were doing this in real life, I would probably maybe clear out my data so that every time I had a new test, um, I, would, I would make sure that I'm actually seeing what those current results are rather than results from a previous test. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much the demo. Um, let me get back to my slides here real quick. Um, and if you'd like to try this at home, I've got all this example code out on GitLab, not GitHub. Um, there's a link here. I, I'm also setting up a blog, um, and it is definitely my plan to go try this with the new 112 stuff and see what that look, look, looks like in comparison to this. So my plan is to go home, play with 112, write a new blog, new blog post. So watch this space and uh, my site link at the end of this presentation. So in closing, there are many applications of A-B testing. So curate solutions and tools for your teams and make sure to document them so they can be used to experiment and innovate. Sometimes your tests are gonna fail, but don't worry. You'll make those pipelines green when you roll back and fix things. Make sure to continuously hack your systems so that your system is built with integrity. Continuously jest your kick-ass team when things go wrong. There's much to learn, and we'll be measuring ourselves every step of the way. Whoops. 
Make sure you have unique names picked out for your projects that you want to open source so you know you can say it when you're presenting live on stage. Question whether the tools and processes you're using are up to the task and refactor them if not. It's been an honor to be here telling our story. And thank you all for coming.